Um, welcome. This is our very first Redefining Public Safety panel. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Cruz. I will be one of your moderators tonight. And I'm here representing Planned Parenthood and the Redefining Public Safety Work Group um, under the Community Budget Alliance. Uh, we are so thankful for all of you for joining us tonight and taking the time to learning what redefining public safety looks like and what could, it could look like here in San Diego. So the Redefining Public Safety Work Group is actually comprised of a couple of organizations. Um, they are listed here on the screen. They are made up of Pillars of the Community, the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties, Mid City Can, Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, Logan Heights CDC, the Center on, Poli Center on Policy Initiatives, Alliance San Diego, and Youth Well. The Redefining Public Safety Work Group advocates for community-based public safety and initiatives and divestment from the system of over-policing and incarceration. We believe the city should reimagine public safety and redirect ineffectively allocated police funds, such as the street gang unit, the gang intervention unit and overtime. And we would hope that they invest, invest in alternatives to policing. So I would now like to invite my fellow colleagues to please introduce yourselves to our attendees. Hi everyone, my name is Zhang Wei. I'm the organizer with the CBI and the CBA Coalition. For now, he, him, his. I'll pass it on to Jamie. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Wilson. I'm with Pillars of the Community in San Diego. She, her, hers, and I'll pass it to Warsan. Hi everyone, Warsan with Youth Will. With youth will. She, her, hers. Thank you all so much for being here. Good to see you all. And I'm going to pass it to Christy. Good evening, Christy Hill with the ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. She, her, hers, and I will pass it to Ana Laura. Hi, everyone. Ana Laura, she, her, hers, Center on Policy Initiative, passing it to Ariana. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ariana. My pronouns are she, her, hers representing Mid-City Can, and I will pass it on to Erin. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Wilson-Nieves, representing Alliance San Diego. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I will pass it over to Neil. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Neil. I'm from uh, Planned Parenthood, and my pronouns are he, him, and I'll pass it over to Kiara. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kiara Pina. I am with the Center on Policy Initiatives and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I will pass it to Michael. Hello everybody, my name is Michael White. I'm with Hello everyone, my name is Michael White. I'm with Pillars of the Community San Diego. My pronouns are him, him, him. And I'll pass it over to Ariana. I believe that in that is everyone. Natasha. Natasha. Oh, Natasha. Sorry. Hi, everyone. My name is Natasha with Logan Heights CDC. Glad to be here. Thank you all so much to our panelists for introducing yourselves. Now we would like to know who all of you are. So if you can please drop your name, your pronouns, what district you live in. Uh, into the chat and also our little check-in question. What does public safety mean to you? Um, I'm gonna give folks about two minutes. So please uh, drop in the chat. Where are you calling us from? Where are you tuning in? Um, and what does public safety mean for you?
Awesome, perfect. It seems like we have some pretty good representation from different districts here in San Diego County, so uh, San Diego City, so we'd love to see that. Um, right now, we are going to launch a poll that will be appearing on your screens pretty shortly, and we have a couple of questions for all of you. Um, we would like for you to let us know what you think uh, the police budget, um, how much money the city allocates to the police budget, um, how much of that is spent on the gang intervention unit, how much of that money in the budget um, is allocated to police overtime, and then lastly, how much money does the city allocate to social services and community programs? We're gonna have the poll up for about 30 seconds to 60 seconds. Uh, so please go ahead and participate in our poll and then we're gonna go over the uh, answers. Make your best educated guess. And while you are all uh, doing the poll, I will like to make a note that if throughout the program you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, that way we don't miss any of your questions and we're able to answer as many as we can by the end of the program. Um, so yeah, let's see, let's see uh, what you all said for those polls. I love seeing like everyone's responses to what like public safety means to them. I'm not sure if y'all are following on the chat, but it's, it's quite amazing. All right, y'all, 10 seconds. All right. Oh, are we able to get the the results up? Sorry, y'all. Awesome. So, how much money of how much money is uh, from the general budget is allocated to the police budget? Yes, that is correct. Five hundred and sixty-eight million dollars is allocated every year, um, and we've noticed that that number only seems to increase every year. Um, number two, within the police budget, how much of it is allocated to the gang suppression unit? That would actually be C, six, 6.4 million. Um, a lot of the money uh, that is used is unfortunately um, goes to the gang intervention unit. Um, and we have two amazing uh, guest speakers who will be going over uh, what that means um, and how they have been in, impacted by the gang intervention unit. Uh, and for overtime, yes, you are all correct, 33.7 million in overtime. Uh, this is really wild as to how we spend our city's resources. Um, and we can go into how we can use that overtime money to create uh, social programs. And then lastly, how much money from the general fund actually goes into social services. Uh, it is actually 280 uh, million. And this is like combined public service or public libraries, uh, social services, um, like parks and rec. So it's maybe a third of what we give to police. Uh, so we can only imagine what we could do if we were to allocate you know, funding from overtime into more social programs. Uh, but now I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Ariana, who's going to really dive into this, um, into the subject. Everyone. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. My name is Ariana. Um, pronouns are she or hers. 
Um, and I really just want to say that I appreciate the folks that were able to submit their comments on what public safety is. And I think it's also important to also acknowledge the violent roots of policing that we we may or may not know of. Um, there's still a lot of learning and a learning to do. Um, when doing this work, um, an acknowledgement that there was a violent occupation of indigenous peoples and their land and the removal of indigenous people from their land. Um, not to say that it doesn't happen, uh, but that's something that we did see um, you know, in early stages. Um, and then also the organization and institutionalizing of slave catchers and slave patrols. Also the enforcement of Jim Crow and segregation laws. This is something that we saw before um, many of the civil rights movements. Um, so just, you know, transitioning into that also understanding that police um, and the, uh, the surveillance of communities, especially black and brown indigenous communities um, during organized labor movements and people's movements. And now how we see even the militarization of police um, and, the, the continuous working of pol the police department working with ICE. So how is it that these um, tactics of fear have been used to really um, make our communities vulnerable? Um, so it's, it was just important for us to just acknowledge the violent roots of policing, um, not to say that they don't exist because um, these roots really do tell a story and do tell a story and why we are continuing to advocate um, for the divestment from the police budget and the reinvestment and reimagining of our communities. So for the next slide, I actually um, pulled up. Amy, can you move on to the next slide, please? For the next slide, um, I just wanted to share a statement that um, was released on behalf of CBA um, to the San Diego City Council. Um, so CBA is a um, is a coalition made up many um, non um, community based organizations that center um, communities of color, Black Indigenous communities, as well as faith based communities, working families. Um, even like the conversation uh, that we saw two weeks ago, we saw that there's still a need to even acknowledge that we're still fighting for, for the funding in our communities to ensure that we have access to services and programming and move away from decriminalizing um, quality of life issues. Um, we want to make sure that we are holistically um, approaching these issues um, in ways we, where we provide safety, where we're able to provide housing, livable wages, um, working conditions for folks, address the um, environment, environment justice, economic equality, even youth services, and start really exploring what alternatives to policing looks like, while also ensuring that we are caring for our community members by providing them with trauma-informed responses. And this, this just happened two weeks ago. Um, and to me, that, that says a lot. I think that we are in a special place where um, we are seeing a lot of advocacy, where we are seeing a lot of movement. However, we're not there yet. Um, and that's why I appreciate the space that CBA has been able to provide in ensuring that you know, folks know what's happening um, with the budget. And so that folks know what, um, in what ways they can empower themselves to really make change. And we'll talk more about that when we invite pillars. Just a review of the budget. Um, we do have over $500 million that is allocated to the budget. So the, but the number that you see um, in the next slide, um, this is the number that comes out of, this is the number that's understood as a San Diego Police Department budget. So this specific budget comes from multiple pockets of funding. So that includes state, city, and federal. So the police budget is made up of different um, sources of funding. So this is just a good visual for y'all to know um, what that looked like that list this past year for um, 2020 um, and what, you know, what we're seeing now as community. For the next slide, um, CPI um, was really great in really showing what the budget 
looks like when we look at it as a whole. So as you can see on the top line, on the top bar, it is the police. So this is based on um, the general funding. So with the general funding, we do see that police, um, the police department is the biggest budget out of all these other issues that include the library, transportation, homelessness strategies, um, and even citywide programs. So from what, from really looking at it, at this graph, we are able to see that from for every three dollars that the city receives, a dollar of that is spent on police, and that's really problematic when we see um, where the budget is going. For the next um, slide, we do see that there has been an increase on the police budget. Every year, um, we have been seeing that the the police budget has been sustaining an increase throughout the past six years, seven years in the 10 year overview. Um, just so you know, the general fund is the fund that is coming from the city um, budget. For the next piece, um, we've identified different pockets of funds that could be allocated and should be allocated to reinvesting in communities. So just a little bit about the overtime, um, looking at the um, use of the funding and how it's mostly used to um, to support admin work, paperwork, neighborhood policing. Um, their role is to support any quality of life cause, and that includes housing, mental health responses, things that could be identified as crime prevention. The gang um, unit, this is something that I won't go much into because our panelists will go into that, but um, they included graffiti strike force as well as identifying and removing um, gang offenders um, and, and just continuing to keep a data of what is um, and who are the folks that are considered to be in a gang. For the next, um, just for, for this, for the sake of time, I do want to acknowledge that there, there is a reclaiming of, of a narrative that we um, are seeing within the advocacy of CBA and just overall for the past year, um, a lot of our folks did, um, you know, showed up to last year's budget hearing, um, ensuring that we are providing care and not um, putting in such a hard emphasis on cops. So on the next slide, I did provide a, a graphic that did, um, does share the overwhelmingly amount of support that we received for Measure B. So Measure B was the establishment of an independent commission. I think overall, this is just a really an, uh, really great start of how we're seeing the need to reimagine public safety for Black and Indigenous communities um, and people of color communities. For our panelists, I do um, want to introduce Pillars of the Community. I'm honored to be introducing two great panelists. Just a little bit about Pillars of, of the Community. They are a, an organization that is based in Southeast San Diego. Um, they strive to counter criminalization of our community, their community, through community organizing, development, and strategic um, partnership. The folks that will be um, here to join us as panelists are Michael and Jamie Wilson. Michael is an organizer at Pillars. Uh, he grew up in San Diego and he will be here to share his life experience with the gang unit. And then Jamie is a gang organizer at Pillars um, and she will be um, speaking more about the gang suppression unit and the funding and where what is a priority for Pillars um, for this fiscal year. So I would like to introduce uh, Michael and Jamie. And thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here, Michael. Hi, Jamie. Hi, thank um, you for having us. <clears throat> I guess um, I'll just guide this um, panel in the first, first piece to this is if you could both talk or um, one of you talk about the gang suppression unit and the impact that this unit has had onto our community. Well, I could start um, with that. Um, my name is Michael Wild, I work for Pillars of the Community. Um, I've been a documented neighborhood crip since I was 11 years old. I didn't actually start claiming neighborhood crip until I was 12 years old. 
And back then, you know, we didn't even think of it as something weird, but what is the, G the gang suppression unit even doing stopping 10 and 11 year olds in the first place? But we, it was normal to us. So they document you as a gang member just because you live in a certain part of town and you happen to have on the Chargers or a Padre shirt. In my, in my area, all my options was, you know, I had to be a crip. The Padres and the Chargers both wear blue. I, <laughs> I couldn't escape it. So you could get caught outside in a Padre shirt or a Chargers shirt. You know, you get caught around some of your little friends and maybe they got in trouble before they, get, you know, was documented. Now you're a documented gang member. They don't tell your parents they stopped you. They don't tell your parents that they documented you as a gang member. Later on in life, you know, you start being a product of your environment. And if you ever get in trouble, they can um, put gang enhancements on you. Instead that you're doing whatever crime you did for the benefit of that gang, like you out there selling drugs and you bring all the money that you make to some guy sitting behind a big table rubbing a cat, laughing evilly. Like, that's not how it works. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in the 90s where uh, we had legendary gang detectives. Pat Burst, he's like the godfather of GSU. He's well retired, but he gave birth to uh, Spears and Murphy, which are, they probably now are retired now because this was in the 90s. These fools terrorized my neighborhood. They would randomly search you for anything. They would drive by you and just look in your car. And if it was a young black male or female, you, you were getting pulled over, searched for hours. Anything they found, it was taking you to jail. And we were just lucky to be let go. We didn't even complain or anything. It was normal to us. Um, all that stuff leads to the prison and the prison sentences being enhanced for anything. Um, it, and, and it even goes back to um, them actually starting stuff. Like if it's been too much peace in San Diego through the ghettos, they'll actually start something. Now I don't have documented proof, but it's, 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 it's in the streets proven that they start stuff just to rile the gangs back up. It's just like in the movie Judas and the Black Messiah, how they were passing out the faith pamphlets. It's still going on to this day. And we're trying to push for peace. And that, when they see that there's too much peace going on, they stir some stuff up somehow, just like they're doing right now in San Diego. But um, the, the GSU has been terrorizing not only my community, but the whole Southeast San Diego community for the past 40 years. And it has to stop. You know, they're documenting kids nowadays because their parents are gang. They're not even, you know what I mean? Just because your last name is whatever, you're a documented gang member because your father or your mother, you know what I mean? It's just not fair. And it's all part of a genocide for the, to get free, free labor in prison later on in life. Just what Michael said, there was never an end to slavery. There was just an involvement. There was never an end to the slave patrol. They just have a new name. Um, and so exactly what Michael said is the experience of still today, our kids. So Michael and I are around the same age. We grew up in the same with exactly what Michael is explaining. And now our kids are dealing with it. The gang suppression unit place in our communities has always been to incarcerate, to criminalize, to arrest, to convict and to keep incarcerated. And then when you get out their job, is to reincarcerate you again. It's a really vicious cycle. Um, you can go to the city's webpage where they actually give a definition of themselves. And it says right on there that they, they're here to vigorously prosecute the most dangerous street gang criminals. But when they say that, they're talking about kids who have stolen a shirt from a store and then they get a gang enhancement. Kids who are artists and they've drawn on a wall and they're 18 years old and they're getting graffiti charges on top of that, not just for getting a graffiti charge, which for anybody else would be a misdemeanor, if that, it becomes a felony for this child and then they get a gang enhancement on top of it. So we have so many kids that are sitting in prison right now as we're having this live discussion that are in for drawing on a wall. They went in at 18 years old and they're sitting in prison for drawing on a wall. Um, 
the gang suppression unit has never served our community. They provide the statistics regarding gang related crime. Um, the courts don't provide that. The statistics don't even come from convictions. They come from what SDPD and the gang unit provides. They feed the media. The media feeds everyone outside of our communities, um, even people within our communities. Um, it feeds that. And then we have this, this demonizing of gang members that has been going on forever. And it's still going on right now. Um, and that's a label that we're, we need to get rid of. We need to, we need to get rid of that. Gang member is not some monster. It's not, it's not anyone different than anybody else. Um, I'm a proud mom of seven children that I've raised here in Southeast San Diego. And one so far is a documented gang member. And he is an amazing person. He was before, he is now as he sits in prison and he will be when he comes home. And I'm not going to allow society, the community, GSU, the news make him or paint him to be something different than he is. And so at Pillars, we're really trying to share with everyone these, these lies and this false narrative that's been, been painted for everyone and that everyone's continuing to eat up. And so that's what we're here for. We're not trying to normalize gangbanging and none of that stuff, but we have to take into account that it's reality. We're from like in our communities, it's like a banded, a banded tribe. And, you know, to us, it's really not that bad. And for us just to get persecuted for growing up in a certain part of town, it's like going to college and being part of Magnum Phi Delta. And you know, for the rest of your life, you get persecuted for it. It's not fair. All gang members aren't bad people. You know, just like they no, say, we're all not cops. normalizing the violence of it. And that's not for some all. reason what people put hand in hand is yeah. violence, crime, and gang member. And we, we're not promoting, advocating, or pushing the violence. But when you take normal youth type um, rebellious activity or, you know, just what we do when we're adolescents. Um, and then you throw gang member on top of it, all of a sudden we have these monsters, but you take a kid doing heroin and stealing for money for heroin in La Jolla, and we're going to give them hugs and rehab. And, but our kids <laughs> are going to prison for less. Um, and another, so definitely what Michael said, and sorry, Michael, go ahead. Sorry about that. Another thing, the GSU isn't even active in East County. I've, I've just came home three years ago from doing a 10 year sentence. I was in prison with countless Europeans with swastikas on their face, all types of racial, they're from street gangs, just white gangs. They don't even exist out there. The DA says that white gangs don't even exist. So they don't even go out there and mess with them. It's, the JSU is designed strictly for the black and the brown community. This is a, a form of racism. I'm retired of it. We want them to go. If, if all these other county uh, communities want more police, they can take ours because we don't need all this. <laughs> We don't need Badly. Yeah, that's what we heard. We heard La Jolla got on a call and wanted more police. La Jolla, we're offering you hours. You can take yes, hours. Let's take go pull first. up 10, 11-year-old kids on skateboards and document them as gang members. Right. You know, and, and let their whole life be messed up, like how you messed up ours. I'm 40, I'm 44 years old. I was documented as 11. They was doing this way before I came. Like, this shit has, it has to stop. Excuse my language. It's getting crazy. Especially when you started document my trying to document my daughters. I have all girls just because their last name is White with a Y, not an I. GSU knows about me. All the, just me speaking on this, I might be a target to a random pullover and search now, but I don't care. Like they do me, I'm filing complaints and, and book and I, it, it has to stop. Yeah, as far as the, the money goes, um, Ariana had mentioned earlier we have what was it 10.4 million goes to the street gang unit um 6.4 million to the gang intervention unit i'm not even sure what that is but what you are paying for everyone who is watching this video now and later what you're paying for is for us to be terrorized our children to be terrorized 
these men, for the most part, men and women, a lot of their, their shifts that you're paying them overtime for, they're sitting at a desk and they're watching me right now, watching and stalking kids on social media. That's what you're paying for. You're paying for them to drive around our communities, not, not outside, inside our communities. My stopping and harassing people. I have four sons, three daughters. I have two sons that are now adults. They lost count of how many times they've been stopped, put in handcuffs, sat on a sidewalk for 30 minutes, an hour, while they ran their names and background checks um, for fitting the description of somebody. We don't know who, but they lost count and they stopped telling me about it. And I have never once gotten a call from a police officer informing me that they had stopped my child ever. Not one time did they ever call home not once. If, they're, if they don't arrest your child for something, they're not calling you to tell you anything because what they want to do and what they're doing is building this big jacket. So each and every time they're stopped, whether they were arrested or not, whether they did anything to provoke the stop or not, that becomes part of, that's an FI, it's a field interview and it becomes part of their jacket. And then you have a kid who's never committed a crime, never done anything wrong, never been arrested, and they have 15 pages of a jacket. So when and if they do ever do something and going before a judge, those 15 pages are making the kids look like monsters in court. When in all reality, they were walking to school. They were going to the park to hang out with their friends. They were doing what kids do. And, and, and then after they give you for gang enhancements and stuff, and you finally release for doing your time, then you have all these gang conditions on your parole or probation. You could be, you could park in the parking lot, hop out the car, be walking inside of a store. It could be a, a South Sider essay walking outside of the store. You guys don't even know each other. You pass right by, what's up, what's up, all what's up. Police sitting there watching you, jam him up, wait till you come out the store, jam you up, say y'all together and give you a gang condition violation. Those used to carry a year straight. I got 10 months straight one time just from being caught around one of my friends I knew my whole life. Never broke no laws. They gave me 10. That was another Christmas in prison. Another one of my daughter's birthdays in prison. Another New Year. Just from being caught around somebody. And who am I supposed to hang with? When I go outside my door, what am I What am I supposed to do? You know what I mean? I don't understand it. But you go to the parole office, they let you hang with 30, 40 gang members right there in front of the parole office. As soon as you walk off the property, you get called one of them. Yep. But they don't prison do that. Or jail yeah. too, right, Michael? Prison or jail? You yeah, but they, 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 they <laughs> stops now. They just send you to the county jail for 10. But when I was getting it, it was, they was giving you a whole year. They call it the bully, the no cut, just for a gang condition violation. And it, it's just ridiculous. You know what well, I mean? That's what, that's what I was saying is that you can get arrested. You'll get arrested for hanging out with yeah. your friends in the street, but the they're brother. throwing you into prison or jail where you only around people from your side. You they make no your sense. Blood. You can get caught around your blood brother. You guys could be from two totally different gangs, two warring gangs that don't even supposed to hang around each other and they will violate you and send you back to prison for that. It, it's just, it's a revolving door. It's all it's all a setup to, to keep the recidivism, you know, to keep it going back and forth. What, just, to, um, just before we close off, um, we heard a lot about the reallocation of the budget, um, especially from the gang unit, um, the gang suppression. Um, could you talk more about where um, where that funding should go to, um, and Definitely. how it really pillars really envision the investing community? Definitely. Um, so, what pillars of the community is envisioning for our communities, um, focusing primarily on districts nine, eight, and four? We want to have drop-in centers. Um, we want this money that's being used to incarcerate to go to these drop-in centers. Within the drop-in centers, we want staff hired from within the community, staff that lives in the community still, has, has been through this, has been to prison, has been to jail, has been harassed by GSU, um, that is still part of the community. So they can do outreach with the youth. Um, we want to have evidence-based violence prevention programs that will happen at these drop-in facilities, um, anger replacement therapy, um, 
cognitive behavioral programs. And then the, the youth would come in and be participants at these drop-in centers. And as participants, part of the benefits that would come with that would be opportunities to travel within the United States, outside of the United States. And those opportunities, we'd like the youth to be able to see shared struggles, shared struggles people with people in other states, um, in other countries. Um, we want to have a 24 hour crisis line where the people on the other end of the crisis line are our people that we've hired within the community um, to respond to. So when there's a, a, a traumatic event, um, there's an act of violence, we're responding to it. And this will wrap in the entire family and not just the actually, you know, the physically involved participants. Um, we need to begin a culture of healing. It's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen right away, but I promise you that continuing the trauma that the police and GSU are inflicting upon our kids, us um, and kids that aren't even born yet, it's prolonging that. It's, it's halting the healing. If it doesn't begin soon, doesn't begin ever, then it's never going to happen. Um, we want to have youth activities, boxing, um, wrestling, computer labs, things like that within this program, paid internships, um, trainings that uh, lead to actual certifications that are recognized by employers. We want to have counseling, mental health programs, um, where the kids feel comfortable. These police ran programs that glorify the youth who have turned their life over and they've denounced gangs are useless and they're pointless. Well, it's the same thing. They're both. They're pointless and useless. And it's a waste of money. It's a waste of money. Put the money back into the community where we know what we're doing with it so that we can begin healing ourselves because nobody else is doing it for us. We would like everyone who's watching to talk to other people. The money that's in this budget is a, it's ridiculous. Um, we want you to support us and what we're trying to do. Call on your city council members, um, mm -hmm. put those votes in when it's time. We need that money re reallocated. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, folks that are watching, we will come back to a Q and A. Um, I just wanna introduce Christy from the ACLU of San Diego County, Imperial Counties. Um, Christy will talk more around protecting the ordinance. So take it away, Christy, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Um, good evening. Uh, again, I'm Christy with the ACLU. And in addition to being a member of CBA, we are also a member of the Coalition for Police Accountability and Transparency. And so on the screen, you can see logos of um, the groups that are involved in CPAT. Um, it's a diverse collection of faith-based labor and community groups um, who work with and in communities that include refugees, immigrants, LGBTQ communities, and communities of color. The diversity of the coalition represents the intersectionality of policing issues. And um, CBA is supporting a law that CPAD is seeking to pass this year in the city of San Diego called PROTECT. PROTECT would require probable cause for stops and searches and would end pretext stops. And CBA is supporting this effort because we recognize that transformative change requires attacking the system from all angles, which means going after the budget, um, but also practices and procedures. And that it's important for us to change all of it. So I'm gonna share a little bit about Protect Now. Um, you just heard from Jamie and Michael about how the police um, target communities of color here in San Diego. And the experiences that they shared are, are not an exception, but really are the way that mm -hmm. our police carry out business. There are too many stories and research that support that police are using a different standard of policing when it comes to black and brown communities. Our communities are more likely to be stopped and searched despite being less likely to have contraband. And this, this is true not only in San Diego, but throughout the state. 
And so based on feedback from, commun from community members over the years and looking at best practices, CPAT developed a set of policy recommendations that include PROTECT. And so, as I said, PROTECT would require probable cause for stops and, search uh, for stops and searches and end pretext stops. These are tactics that um, GSU and other law enforcement can use to target communities of color. Um, and so PROTECT um, seeks to take, to take that away. Um, and if you wanna learn more about PROTECT, um, we will be holding, CPAT will be holding a town hall on March 30th. Um, Ariana, you can go, yeah. Um, and the link will get dropped in the chat. Um, and, you, and, and we'll be talking in more detail about PROTECT there. Also, if you're interested in letting your elected officials, not only in the city of San Diego, but in the county and in other cities, um, to encourage them to pass laws like PROTECT and other recommendations um, that are being advanced by CPAT, you can send an email to them through our email action, which is um, on the screen bit.ly um, forward slash in the stops. And we'll drop that in the chat as well. But um, we hope that we can count on your support. Again, Protect really is seeking to address these practices um, like pretext stops, which are basically stops where the police are stopping you on the premise that let's say like you rolled through a stop sign, but then they begin to question you about um, other, other things like where are you going, where have you been? They might ask if you can, if, if, if they can search your car. Um, and it's in these types of interactions that we know trauma is being inflicted up upon our communities and that um, folks are being subjected to a different standard of, 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 of policing and protect us seeking to end that. Um, so I will stop there. I will pass it to Warsan, who will lead us into our Q&A session. Thank you so much, um, Christy. Um, and thank you all so much for being here. Now, if the panelists can come on um, camera, please. Um, we have a few questions from our attendees um, that we would like to go over. Um, first question, um, and as we go through the Q&A, if you all have any questions, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A tab here on Zoom, and we will make sure to um, check on it and like follow that. First question is from one of our attendees, Andrea. Um, and this is, I think, more for Jamie and Michael. Uh, what is the difference between the street gang unit and the gang intervention slash suppression unit? I'm the gang intervention unit is funded for what it for inter intervention. The street gang unit is those are the people who are supposed to be feet in the streets. Um, where that money is going to as far as gang intervention um, funding is going or those programs that I was talking about that are useless and other things. I don't, I, I couldn't even tell you what's in place because there, there isn't anything in place that is a true intervention. I hope that answered your question. I think pretty much, um, I, I really don't know what the difference is between GSU and gang intervention. Um, one's supposed to help help with intervene, you know, intervening, but they don't. But the GSU is um, the only ones we're really familiar with. They're the ones that terrorize us, and I'm pretty sure they're all wrapped up in the same in the same bunch. Yeah, thank you both so much, and thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, and as we go through these questions again, if any of the other panelists would also like to add anything. Uh, please um, do so. You're more than welcome to do that. Uh, we had another question from one of our attendees. And again, I think this is a question more for Michael and Jamie. Uh, what led you to do the work that you're doing right now? And what advice would you give um, to those who uh, want to help? Well, um, I'll take it first. Me, um, I've always uh, loved my people. When I was young, I just had a weird way of showing it. It's love I showed to my people is the love I showed to my gang. And as I got a little older, you know, did a lot of years in prison, it, it came to the realization that, you know, 
it was other guys that just because they wasn't from my gang, it wasn't bad people. So I started loving my people more. It just, you know, I didn't care where you were from as long as you were a solid individual. And then um, when the George Floyd thing happened, that really like was a turning point for me because um, I don't know if you guys seen it, but this t- it was on Facebook, the guy with the whip, you know, he was on the corner and they calling people niggers as they drove by because La Mesa had just burned down and they were saying that we better not bring our black asses to Santee with that shit and it just enraged me. And um, so I put a Facebook post. I have a real good uh, following on Facebook. So I put the post up on Facebook and it kind of went up. Me and like 11 other gang members, all gang members. I ain't going from, it was all gang members. We pushed out there to Santee to see what the white boys was talking about. You know what I mean? And long story short, it ended out beautifully. It wasn't no conflict, all that, you know, tough guy stuff. It was talking the day before. It it didn't, none of it came to the front that day. And it ended real beautiful. We we ended up getting a, a... a good accord with those white guys that was out there that day. And from that moment on, I've just been pushing the push. You know what I'm saying? Um, I I grew up like, like Michael did. You kind of just accept it for what it is. And then as you get a little bit older, you expose yourself to what written, written laws are and you start reading and you start seeing things, you, you, you start questioning. Um, and the more I talk to people who didn't ever have these experiences, I was realizing that this isn't normal. People outside don't, they're, they don't even know about a gang enhancement, a gang injunction, gang documentation. They weren't even knowing. So at Pillars of the Community, we've spent, I've, we've both done some traveling. We, we try and speak everywhere, um, letting people know what these things are because anything that people hear that's anti-gang or, you know, throw the gang members away. They're like, yes, we're helping. We're helping. No, you're not helping. That's not helpful. Um, but when it came to, as I said, I grew up like this, like the, it's just normal, but my, my biggest fire came from when they started playing with my son. That was a different kind of anger and a different kind of hurt. Um, watching my son and all the babies, I'm all his friends, get played with and harassed the way that they they do it's it's a way different type of a feeling so the push that's behind me um for the most part is what they're doing to our kids and what you can do to support is to follow follow organizations like ours follow pillars of the community um we when it's time to vote we need to get rid of gang enhancements gang injunctions have to go these things have to go and we do need your support we need to push you to push your council members i live in district four we have monica montgomery step and she's a very supportive city councilwoman other city council um leaders are not so supportive of these things but they need your vote to stay there. So we need you to push your city council members, you to put words in with your our mayor. Um, just follow our lead on these things because you don't know anything about, if you don't know anything about it, just follow our lead. We're the ones affected and we're, we're not going to hurt ourselves. So we're not asking you to hurt our communities. We're telling you and asking you to do what's going to be beneficial. Thank you both so much. Um, another question from one of our from one of our attendees. Um, I think this is more for Christy. Um, how does Protect ensure that there's less money and authority being allocated to SDPD? Um, that way, um, they don't have more power um, and more money, like they did, um, like like it happened with, in the past with the body cams. Yeah. Um, so protect is, is not about changing the amount of money going to, to the police. Um, that's why I think it's important that like we're attacking the issue from all sides. Protect is about changing how the police operate on the streets, right? And taking away a tactic that they use to terrorize our communities. And so um, we know from, you know, listening to impacted community members' experiences around how the police you know, are going to neighborhoods, um, stop cars, stop you on, on, on your bike while you're walking um, for no reason outside of you look suspicious 
or why are you in this neighborhood at this time? Where are you going? Protect is seeking to stop that type of actions from happening, right? And those actions happen a lot. Those are the types of actions we know that can escalate into more lethal situations. But I think it's important that, you know, a lot of um, the focus in media can go toward um, fatal interactions with, with police, which are obviously important, but there are these daily microaggressions and targeting that's happening to our kids, to um, adults by police that need to be addressed. And so PROTECT is seeking to address that by saying that you cannot ask someone for consent to a, for a search unless you have probable cause to think that a crime, that unless you know that a crime has been committed, right? Um, and uh, because we know that people will give consent because they're scared. There's someone in a uniform with a gun asking you, can I search your car or being? Do you really feel in a, in a place to say no? Um, and so protect is saying that that, that, that that is no longer a tool you will have to harm and inflict trauma on our, on our communities. And the budget piece is about um, is, is, is where you know the CBA, the Community Budget Alliance advocacy comes into place. And it's what Jamie and Michael are talking about, about identifying funds that, that can be targeted to divest from um, harmful practices by the police um, and say, let's invest this in community-driven solutions. Um, and, and you heard that tonight. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Christy. Another question that maybe this can be something that somebody from the Red County Public Safety Group can um, answer in relating to where we're asking the funding for our priorities to come from. Um, there was a question um, on, sorry, give me one second. Oh, there you go. Um, what is the specific CPA proposal to reduce um, funding from the gang expression unit? Is there a call to dissolve this completely? And how can we all help to advocate uh, for cutting the funding? I believe Kiara has just already answered as well. Um, basically, to say the CBA is calling for reallocating fund from the department to reinvest in community through funding the independent commission of the police practice, develop redefining public safety action plan, develop a youth violence prevention program, and stop the pipeline to prison by supporting you for more in-depth list of our advocacy priorities, the policy demands on our website. The link is inside the q and A. I also included it in the chat um, for folks interested in, in kind of diving in and learning a bit more, but um, you know, we'll also, we discussed Protect today, and then our, I think on our second event, um, we'll be also diving into to some other of these priorities um, as well. Thank you both so much. Um, trying to see if there's any other questions. Um, there's a question about protect. How can the city um, support protect ordinance through funding? Um, is it just um, through passing the ordinance or how exactly do you see the funding helping protect? So there, there's no funding request with, with protect. It's asking the city to pass the ordinance. And um, we'll be able to share more information about that in the coming months. But the first step you can take to learn more um, is to attend the town hall at the end of this month on March, March 30th. And we'll drop that in the chat again. Thanks, Christy. There's a, another question from one of our, one of our attendees um, that says, do you think it, it would be worth, worthwhile or even possible to meet with officers or to get them to understand and listen to the black and brown communities how black and brown communities are affected, um, have, the, um, have a community form question mark. Um, maybe it's already um, been tried. Um, and I just wanna see if any of the panelists have any input on that. I, I see everyone smiling. We're all smiling because the effort has been made time and time again by multiple organizations, by multiple individuals in multiple ways, the interest isn't there. How else 
are you going to keep all of this money and explain it as necessary for the police <laughs> if if we were to fix everything it's not it's it's not something they want it's not what they want at least not in our communities it's not something that they want if i may charm in here oh ariana go ahead i would just also share um that i mean it, it has already happened but i i think like going back and just like really revisiting the roots of you know policing and why it exists was really important because it wasn't meant to really serve us um and our folks are tired like that's why we work hard to really start developing developing our people to using their voice to sharing their stories i'm not only focusing on budget like policy is really impacting us every day um and for such a long time you know we were kept in the dark um from what what power we have because we really do have a lot of power when we come together and that's why it's so important to uplift the work that we're doing on policy priorities, budget priorities, um, and even continuing to move forward with how we're reimagining like public safety and um, our own communities and how they are showing up to spaces like the San Diego City um, Council and you know the mayor's budget. So here is my answer to that question and. It's depend on what you think, how do you think police, because for the folks that I work with, you know, the police is a system and the system will write rules, will do things to protect itself. Every time that we talk about police accountability, it comes up and then on kind of, on kind of effort from the police union basically push back, right? We talk about Dr. Shirley Weber bills up at the state level, it got watered down because the police union basically puts so much money into it and like push back. And then we also talk about like every, like, so it's interesting to me because every time we talk about police accountability, they're gonna come back to it and they're like, oh, we need more training and more training always come with more money. And, and for the first time with last year when San Diego community groups was back and said, nope, we're not gonna give you any more money because if you can train people, you can perform your job well, then we're going to try to take the money and go and invest in a program that work better for us and make sure that, you know. Um, but so is this like an interesting dynamic conversation shifting right now? Because we re-evaluating re everything the, the police does. Um, so I want to ask you that, even take that question, take that answer for a second to contemplating on it, okay? So if you have a business and a customer complaining about your services, what do you do? You go back and you rewrite, right? And you train your people. You don't go around, you don't go to the bank and say, I need more money so that I can retrain my people so, so that they can provide the service better. You don't, you just rewrite stuff. So the other question I also have for the police and if like police department and feel free, any of y'all feel free to walk up to the police and ask them as well. When you were hired, don't you go to the police academy? Don't the police train you? Yeah, I'm sure they train you, right? If they train you and the current training guy suck and not working out well, what do you do? Do you go back and rewrite those, those training guy or you just kind of like give it a lift service? So let's be real. They don't want, they don't want accountability. They don't want any changes. So um, we're tired of having conversations with them because like if they're not willing to change, there's so much that you can only do, right? So that's my answer. Um, thanks, um, Jamie, Ariana, and Nishan Wee. There's a question um, that may be outside of CPA jurisdiction, but we may be able to refer to like ISDF, or maybe somebody can talk about that a little bit. Um, shouldn't all these conversations be including the DA who decides who to prosecute or not? All of these decisions are from the DA. Every time you're, we're, you hear us talking about prison, Michael's prison sentence was signed off by the DA. The charges were signed off by the DA. I have five of my babies, not literally I've given birth to them, but five of them in prison right now, the DA signed off on charges because they were at a park and carloads of men came to this park, attacked them, 
they're charged with it. Be, they got gang enhancements. They got assault charges. I never got a call home telling me that my minor child was involved in an altercation um, that they watched go on. Um, the DA is involved in every step of this process. You have to join us in voting in a competent DA, which is not what we have. We have a DA that hates gang members. The DA is the, the, the main orchestrator of the whole shebang because they're the ones that make you, they paint you out as a, a monster. Trust me, I, I done seen it to where they really paint you out as a monster just because you grew up in a certain part of town. So the DA is very aware of all this stuff that's going on. Trust me, they're orchestrating to fill the prisons up for free labor. It's all part Absolutely. of the plan. That budget involves them. Without the DA and the charges and the prosecute, the convictions, where's the need for the police? They're friends. Do a public records request on the info, the emails and phone calls and exchange of information and the relationship between the district attorney's office and the San Diego Police Department. They're one person. That is one. Yeah, thank you both so much for sharing that. And if I can add, um, we do have another coalition that does uh, countywide advocacy as well. I the Invest in San Diego Families Coalition. So if you all want to look into social media um, to get more involved in that coalition as well. Um, another question from one of our attendees is, I want to learn more about the documenting practice um, and targeting, etc. So I can share this knowledge with others. Um, does uh, the pillars of the community have more info slash testimonials um, about these practices on their website. Um, where could I find more information about how this happens in San Diego? Pillars of the community, we do have a website. Um, it's, we'll post it in the chat. Um, we also have so far two books that we've finished that are, it's a, collaboration of stories from different community members. Um, uh, Reclaiming Our Stories 1, we have Reclaiming Our Stories 2. Um, and you'll get a really intimate and um, an intimate exposure to different people's experiences. Um, both of those books are available I'm, on our website, I'm sure. And um, we do, we have a lot of information. So feel free to reach out at any time and those two books also. Thanks, Jamie. Um, another question that we have on here is, why do you think our politicians who say Black Lives Matter are not holding the police accountable? Is it the police unions that, you, um, that have power over them? What is it? And this is for anyone. I'd be happy to chime in. Um, yeah, the police union definitely does have a really strong grip on politicians. So they have a pack and they are able to fund some of these candidates, whether they're Republican, whether they're Democratic, uh, because they are nonpartisan and they will endorse both Democratic and Republican candidates. Um, and it, it's very evident, especially with the vote that happened um, when we recently voted or when the council recently voted for a council president. Um, the police union did not want uh, council member Monica Montgomery step to be council president because they understand that she is a threat to um, their union um, because she does not believe that the police should continue to get more funding. Um, and it's evident. You can literally follow the money, y'all. Um, if you go on the Secretary of, Web Secretary of State website, you can actually see who funds these candidates. And we can see who the police uh, is actually putting money behind. And these are the candidates that, or the uh, politicians that they will be counting on to make sure that they continue to fund uh, the police. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything else. Can I share the screen on bit, y'all? It's awesome, it's wild. So. <laughs> Do it. I'll do it. Okay, so you can go to this website called checkthepolice.org, California, which I dropped a link inside the chat as well. 
you can tell right here is that 118 of the state Senate and Assembly member and the governor in California take the money from the police, only two did not. Screenshot if you want. That is the reason why we cannot pass meaningful police accountability laws in California. Thank you both so much. The last question that we have in the Q&A is when it comes to police on, on college grounds, some educators and community members in the local community are making a strong push to defund the police and reallocate funds um, being used to pay the police. Um, in the meantime, classes um, in ethnic studies such as Chicano, Chicana studies and other important student um, support programs continue to be cut. How do you see the work you all are doing with these important campaigns to defend the police on local community colleges? Well, we, um, at Pillars, our, our view on that is we want to be totally taken off of schools all the way to all the way because um, what they're doing is they're, they're getting these kids for ditching or whatever. It usually is just sending detention and they're giving them records and they're training them to go to prison. And it, none of it is, is, is helping. School shootings are still happening. No, no school police be in there to, to stop those things. They're only there to torment black and brown kids and, and set the, the path of their, their future to go to prison. Um, so at Pillars, our, our stance is we think they should be yanked out altogether and that the money should be reallocated somewhere else. There was a vote recently for the um, community college district. Also, um, Brother Khalid Alexander, um, we have more information on that over at Pillars, but we were, there was a vote, uh, uh, there was, they asked for input. We don't want more police anywhere. Just step back and, and follow the votes, make votes, but step back for a second and think about how punitive this world has become, how punitive we've become as a society. When did everything, every bit of everything, the focus is punishment. We're like, don't do this or this is gonna happen. And I'm not just talking about gangs, I'm talking about everything. Where are the people that are saying, okay, let's look at the situation. How, what's going on here? Let's figure this out, let's sit down. What happened? No, we're like, if you do this, this is gonna happen. Just in general, in, within families, in the community, the city, the state, the country, we're so punitive. Um, just look at that for a second. All, we're, this is what we get told all our lives. So we're getting this, and then in communities like ours, we're getting this from the gang unit as well. Um, it's just traumatic all the way around. I feel like I always have to, I had to add that in just because sometimes you, we really don't. We just have accepted that punishment. That's what we need to focus on in this world is punishment and how we punish people. And it's not about actually fixing anything, deterring anything, healing anyone. Um, so reevaluate yourself, um, follow the votes and follow Follow us, follow CBA, follow each of the organizations you see represented um, with CBA on today's panel and then the panels to come as well. Um, we'll. We'll have all that information for you. We'll keep you up to date. That is actually a great transition um, into our next portion of the event. Um, thank you all so much for um, sharing your um, input and for your, your knowledge and expertise in this Q&A session. Um, and I know there were a lot of questions around like, how can we get involved? What can we do? Um, and we will be answering those questions right now. Um, so on that note, I'm gonna pass it to Erin. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Arsan, and thank you everyone um, for being here tonight and engaging us uh, so greatly with all of your questions. Um, how do you get involved? What can we do next, right? Um, so, we are going to talk to you about a couple of ways to demand action tonight from our mayor and our city council members. Um, so there should have been a link dropped in the chat 
um, that will have further instructions about what I am explaining. Um, so once that link is dropped, please click on it. I'm gonna wait for it to drop so I don't go ahead of you. Okay, perfect, there it is. Um, so this link will take you to a Google Doc that will have several different actions. The first being is sending a letter to um, our mayor, Todd Gloria, and it is an already pre-drafted letter that you can send to him demanding action on these topics that you see on your screen and everything we talked about tonight. Um, and if you are more interested in doing something on social media, we also have an option for that with our social media storm. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a storm. We want as many people on social media, there's about 77 participants right now, um, to download the graphic on the link and share it on your social media, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, um, or Twitter. And we want you to tag your council member or all of them if you want, and the mayor, and let them know that you all in our communities are watching and you wanna see something different from them. Um, so I am going to pause for a couple of seconds, let you all get that downloaded and get it onto your social media with a caption, sharing your story, sharing why you think this is important. Um, and so, so let's do it. I'm going to get it on my social right with you right now. And we're going to be looking after this event to see who posted just to see your personal stories. Um, and you can tag CBA, I believe. Um, John, we do you mind dropping CBA's um, tag on Instagram and all our socials in the chat so that folks can tag us and we can see it later. All right, and I will move on as John Wee gets that. Um, and then I believe on the sheet, the next steps after sharing on social media and our social media storm is attending the rest of our budget panels. We have, we talked a lot about um, the police budget or public safety budget tonight, but we have a lot of other issues that we um, are working on. Uh, environmental justice, housing and tenants rights, workers rights, and we also want you all to be educated on those and what we are going to be advocating for coming up um, in the city budget. So I would love for you all to join, we would love for you all to join us. Um, the dates are here, and this graphic is also in the Google Doc that you um, have opened up, so you can save it from there as well. Um, and we have all of your emails and how you signed up tonight, and we will be reaching out to you to make sure you have the information to attend these events. And I believe that is it for me. And so I will pass it on to our next speaker. I believe that would be me. Um, yes, as Aaron was mentioning, please uh, join us um, and join the rest of our work groups. Uh, the Democratizing Power will be having an event March 9th, um, Environmental Justice March 16th, Housing Tenants uh, March 23rd, People's Economy uh, March 30th, and uh, the Redefining Public Safety will be hosting a second panel event where we will be really diving in into our, pan, um, into our budget and pie, uh, I'm sorry, y'all. Budget and policy priorities, sorry. Um, and you can literally uh, learn all of our demands as a CBA. Um, we will also be then like wrapping you all up and getting ready for budget hearings. Um, I know some of you all were wondering, how can I get involved? How can I make this process? You know, how can I get involved in the process? We will be having budget hearings and we will need public comment, public testimony. Um, we are gonna need the community to show up. So then council, uh, city council members and the mayor know that like we mean business and we are gonna hold their feet to the fire. We're gonna hold them accountable. They made a lot of promises on the campaign trail and it's time for them to actually show up for our communities and to work for our communities because at the end of the day, we are the ones that voted them in. 
So again, please join our events. Um, I also wanna take the time to thank our amazing panel, Jamie, Michael, Adriana, Chrissy, uh, Warson, John Wee, uh, Neil, Kiara. Uh, thank you all so much for sharing your stories, for taking the time to educating all of us. Um, and again, the link uh, should have been dropped uh, for, for all of our panelists events. Sign up to all of them. We would love to see you. Um, and I believe that is it, y'all.